as a last speaker, I definitely, I will also repeat maybe, maybe, I also try to maybe come back to certain things that has been said today. Um, I've been asked to talk about social innovation and I will go more into how open design also can become business, social uh, business, or social enterprise. Um, but first I want to uh, uh, start with Mr. Friedman. Let's see how I get there. Okay, because it's now connected to another monitor, I can't um, open it. Let's wait. I have another way to do this. Look at this lead pencil. There's not a single person in the world who could make this pencil. Remarkable statement? Not at all. The wood from which it's made, for all I know, comes from a tree that was cut down in the state of Washington. To cut down that tree, it took a saw. To make the saw, it took steel. To make the steel, it took iron ore. This black center, we call it lead, but it's really graphite, compressed graphite. I'm not sure where it comes from, but I think it comes from some mines in South America. This red top up here, the eraser, bit of rubber, probably comes from Malaya, where the rubber tree isn't even native. It was imported from South America by some businessmen with the help of the British government. This brass ferrule, I haven't the slightest idea where it came from, or the yellow paint or the paint that made the black lines, or the glue that holds it together. Literally thousands of people cooperated to make this pencil. People who don't speak the same language, who practice different religions, who might hate one another if they ever met. When you go down to the store and buy this pencil, you are in effect trading a few minutes of your time for a few seconds of the time of all those thousands of people. What brought them together and induced them to cooperate to make this pencil? There was no commissar sending out offices from, sending out orders from some central office. It was a magic of the price system, the impersonal operation of prices that brought them together and got them to cooperate to make this pencil so that you could have it for a trifling sum. That is why the operation of the free market is so essential, not only to promote productive efficiency, but even more to foster harmony and peace among the peoples of the world. So, um, Mr. Friedman, let's go back. Where are we in? Nope. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Mr. Friedman uh, has, it's as if he thinks about this by himself, the pencil story, but it's a story that has been written in 1985 by uh, Mr. Reed, uh, Leonard Reed, and he writes his story about a pencil from the perspective of this pencil. He says, how many people are involved in making the pencil? And then later on, Friedman makes this story and, and builds upon the story about the pencil, uh, the argument why we need a free market. Um, and not only a free market, he also says the impersonal system based on pricing. And I think this is definitely what now is at stake. We have a economy is based, it's an impersonal economy based on pricing. So, what are we missing at the moment? We're missing social values in this story. Nobody knows who were the workers. So we want to have this, this impersonal part of the story 
is in, in fact the thing that is now missing. Uh, we have no idea who, was the, who were all these owners. What is the ownership in the pencil? Who made the money out of the pencil? Who is being paid uh, to make the pencil? We have no idea about the responsibility that we have towards, um, for example, uh, mining. He was mentioning mining. What is happening in the mines? What, what's uh, the whole story about sustainability is, of course, lacking. There's no transparency at all in, in, in the whole system of making pencils. Um, the whole free market also dumps pencils in other countries and then people are out of work. Um, and in this whole system, there's no reciproci reciprocity. There's no way that we can engage with the system because we only are the consumer of the pencil. And this sort of idea of free market also says that we don't have to know about the system behind the pencil. So, um, and we'll come back to the story about what uh, Peter was introducing. It's alienation. We have no idea how we relate to our objects and to our stuff around us. Um, and actually, uh, of course, we know that Marx, we should not make Marx re very uh, fashionable because there's a lot of things happened in his name. We should not be uh, um, ignorant about that. But still, I think his, his definition of alienation is a very interesting uh, uh, topic. And I think we should sort of rethink and redefine this idea of how we relate to our environment. And uh, especially this part where he says that um, when deprived of the right to think of himself as a director of his actions, that we, we are not uh, an actor in our own lives anymore. We are really there to, to consume what other people have made for us. So I think this whole maker's movement that we're talking about today and this whole idea of responsibility and reciprocity of systems is based on this idea that we want to be, uh, uh, again, back in our own rights, back in our own uh, structure. And um, it's this that I think we should sort of fight, uh, we should figure out how to get back in our responsibility. Um, so what we now see, oh, this is the alienation part. So what we now see is that a lot of people are trying to figure out how the stuff are being made. Uh, and all, all each of these pieces, we try to figure out where are they made, who is responsible for the piece, can I make it myself, can I make our own car, our own drone, our own uh, space shuttles. I think this, this is a remarkable, is this happening for the last 20 years, we are also even moving into biotechnology, I will come back on that later. Um, and this is also a very interesting project by Thomas, uh, who started to think about how to make a toaster. So he first figured out what is in the toaster. And then he started to make it all by himself, which has not really uh, happened really well. I mean, this is what he came up with. Uh, after two years of working, he tried to make each piece of the toaster by himself, uh, which is, I mean, in a way, uh, a pencil is even easier to make. So, so he sort of tried to, to do this. So why, are we, why can we make stuff and not ending up with this kind of products? Because we have this, this underlying system, this architecture underlying everything what we're talking about today. Um, we are having a system that is a distributed network. This is a picture from 1964, where um, um, it has been a design for the internet. And there was still an idea of like, what kind of architecture shall we choose? A, a centralized system, but it's very vulnerable because it can be attacked in the middle. Uh, a, a, Decentralized system, which is still very vulnerable, or a distributed network. And, well, obviously, they have chosen for a distributed network. And that's why we can talk about personal computing and personal fabrication. Because we have nodes that can be a sender and a receiver at once. You can make parts of the internet without having going to a central authority. Uh, we know that a lot of things are at stake at the moment at the internet, and we still have to really have to preserve this concept of the distributed network. Because this is what's enabling us all to, to work and collaborate together and also create an, uh, knowledge together. And this is how the, so, the same sort of structure about distributed networks implies and how I perceive social innovation. So normally we had to deal with the authorities, with knowledge institutes, governments, larger firms and, 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 and bigger companies. And suddenly, we, because we can connect directly without going through these institutions, we can build up new networks and new knowledge networks and also new collaborations. And many of the, uh, the examples that have been shown on shown today are using this part of the, the, of, of the, 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 the capacity of the distributed network. Um, of course, the personal computer is there for the, was, was there for the 70s, 
I wish I thought it could be like the icon for it for for the information uh, technologies, but now we are moving into this digital and personal fabrication. So coming from the industrial age where we moved all the fab the, the factories out of our uh, uh, our cities, now the, all these small factories come back in our backyard and in our own um, uh, in our own houses, which I guess in, in, in the coming years will get also some we will get into trouble because people when start doing things with only the 3D printer is no real problem. But when we also start to make uh, bio uh, materials and maybe methyl and all the other stuff, people will start to maybe complain about their neighbors making a lot of noise and also maybe making a lot of, uh, producing a lot of smell. But still at the moment, we're moving out of this area and going into this personal area. But we're also moving out of this uh, sort of nightmare where we have the old industrial uh, uh, um, set up being empty and being revitalized by a lot of creative companies and small uh, uh, SMEs. But looking through this sort of like this old structure of the industrial revolution, we're looking at this management layer, people that are ruling the world by abstraction, by thinking about the world and managing the world. And um, I think what, we are, what we're facing is um, uh, going back to this idea of ha having responsibility and going away from managing on abstraction and being very concrete, having relationships based on real uh, essential things. Um, but we have to look into what kind of model of economy this means. Uh, the, the story of Friedman was not just a story. I, he, I think he, spent, he has a, a, an audience of three million people with educational content and the pencil that you just heard about has been presented to a lot of children. It has been a whole wave of education on this free market principle, which is really a fundamental concept about economy. We need another concept about economy. We have to teach ourselves that the idea of economy that we are used to is not the only way we can look at economy, because economy in itself as a word means household. It is about how we trade values. And there are other models for that. And one of those that uh, are, are very interesting, is a very interesting resource for peer-to-peer -peer economy, is the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation. I think Michael Bowens has been mentioned today already. I think what he's doing with a group of people is, is, is very, very interesting. I think the new models for economy will come from this kind of research. And, this, and we, we have to come up with other ways of measuring value, because at the moment, our own political parties have to rely on economic uh, databases and models and algorithms that don't really tell the story that we are t t telling each other here today. So we have to civilize the economy. So it's not that we have to go away from economy, we have to rethink what we think is economy. We have to bring the civil person back into the story. And um, of course, at the end, it's, it's by doing. So this is a theory, and there are a lot of people are working on this kind of new concepts. They're working on concepts for social enterprise that you put social values first, instead of only doing it by, uh, at the end of the, of the product line. Um, but I can present you, I think, three projects now that are all underway, using open design as a principle in the, in the product itself or in the service itself. So it's based on open design, it's also based on social entrepreneurship. The first case I want to present to you is Fairphone. I'm, I'm not sure, maybe you all know the Fairphone, maybe somebody bought the Fairphone. Just Look in the audience if anybody has ordered a Fairphone. Um, Fairphone is based on this sort of waste of, um, of, of our, our gadgets. Um, and we all know, I hope you know, that we have blood in the mobiles. In, in the mobiles there are conflict minerals, there are working conditions, there is a waste, e-waste coming from this mobile industry. And we have research at the Waag for two years, we have researched this whole chain of production of telephones like the, the, the pencil of, to, of, this, of, of, of this century. And we, we figured out, we talked with everybody, we researched, we looked in how to make a, a, a phone and how to make a fair phone. And at the end, last year, we realized that nobody was willing to make a fair phone. None of the, of, the, of, of the companies in the chain, in the production chain, wanted or could move uh, because they're too big. There are too many things at stake. There are too, too, too many problems to solve. And uh, they, they were not able to really make the move. Um, so at the end, somewhere in the summer, we re realized that making a nice research project and trying to prototype a fair phone was not enough. If you really want to have impact, you have to make the next move. So we realized that we had to go and make the fair phone. 
Um, because of the structure that we uh, you just introduced, the VAG Society is a research entity, but we also have the VAG Products. VAG Products is a, is a very small incubator. It is there to help to, to get for our own research to go into, into practice, into market. It's patient capital, it's social capital. It's capital that doesn't, is not shareholder driven, but it's socially driven. And I think this is all very, very important because Fairphone only can survive when there's no shareholder's value outside from, from, from the team that's, that's, that's running the project at the moment. Um, so where we have we looking at? We're, basically, this is where, it, where a lot of the materials come from, from the mines in Congo and other mines, the coltan and that, uh, the gold and all the and tin. These are all being mined in conflict areas. And you can't, there are only a few places where you have a closed loop in having fair mined uh, coltan or fair mined tin. And we work together with these places. So these, there, there's a few of those projects and we are collaborating with them. So we, we also went to these places. So it's not that we just have an abstraction. We went and talked with people and we were there and, and discussed it and we have engagement from this, these places. So for the fair farm, we're looking at a, a, a few um, areas. And m m I think one of the most important ones is that we want to be sure that the materials that we use are fair. And uh, a lot of people are trying to figure out, is the, can, you have, can you sort of have a look at the whole production chain? And this is not possible. So Bas van Abel, uh, uh, the, the, the team leader from, from, from Fairphone, he um, sometimes makes remarks and people sort of are, they, they say, well, please tell us that this is totally fair. And he said, well, it's only possible to make a fully fair product if you have world peace. World peace is the only, only because you will never be able to, to control the whole production chain. But we can control some parts of it. So the Fairphone is a movement, not an end product. It will have a lot of iterations, and it will need also next steps. Uh, but we can say that we have an open design model, uh, because we will install it with Android for the people that don't want to hack a phone. But it also will have, you know, also have root access, so people can install other operating systems, like uh, Ubuntu and, um, and, um, and the other one, Firefox. So it's already being made by the idea of being transparent about all the elements in the product. It's, it's, it's open in the sense that people can install their own operating system, and it's a movement in which we also engage people and ask them to, to participate and make, help us to make it more fair. Uh, which is in, in, at the moment very interesting because the companies that were not able to make, do it themselves are supporting the project and, and trying to help to make this happen. Because many people within the companies are aware that they have a very problematic um, uh, production chain and that they want to, to, to continue and want to change their own industry. Um, why is this not happening? Okay, okay. This is the, con so we have conflict-free tin and tantalum. We have a rootable operating system. We work with a factory that has a, world, a worker welfare production lane. So we, we actually ex uh, um, are there at the factory and not uh, doing it with, uh, with inter in intermediates. There's a replaceable battery, which at the moment most uh, um, of the problems are that they, you can't open the phone. Uh, this is really the most, uh, most open about it, is that if you buy a phone or any gadget, if you open it, it's broke. And uh, you, you, have no, you have no guarantee that it will be ma made again. So we make a phone that you can open without being, uh, you don't have to be uh, careful. There's an e-waste program, and also because a lot of people have two phones, it has dual SIM. So you can have one phone for work and, and uh, private. Well, all this is, of course, a very, very nice idea, but how to raise the money and how to, how to stay out of the hands of, 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 of venture capital. Um, and that's how we did it with the campaign. We asked people to participate in it and said, maybe if you, want to, if, you buy, you, if you buy the phone now, you will get it in October. And at the moment, I think this is very recent, we said we need 5,000 people to, to, to buy the phone, and then we go, can go in operation. And at the moment, 10,754 people bought the phone. So we can go into production uh, by crowdsourcing by, or pre-sales even. This is, this is a crowdsourcing on our own platform. So we haven't used any other platform, not Kickstarters, no any other place. We really thought Fairphone was st strong enough to, to do this on, our, on its own premises and on its own idea. 
So now we, ha now we are in business, and now we have to make this kind of steps, going really into the factories, participating with, 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 with the people that are working on fair mines and all, all that. So the, the team of fair for now is a startup um, from Amsterdam, and it's business connected with a lot of people also in London and other places. And they have a very, very, very big challenge to, 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 to do, but they will, the, the fair farm will be there in October. And that will be the first fairly produced, uh, fairer produced phone. I have to be very careful with that. Um, we're also working on the next level. So we have this um, uh, boot camp, getting people from all kinds of places together to rethink also the next generations of fair farm which also designed a roadmap to fairware, which is a step further than only the, the telephone. We also are, uh, relate, we have been asked to, to think about a smart meter, how to make a fair meter. So these principles about fair tech is also moving into other areas of our gadgets and all, or our, our, our technologies. Um, I, won't, I won't get into details in this, uh, this one, but, but I can uh, put it online or, or assign you to where it stands online. Um, the next case would be the low-cost prosthesis. It's less far as the Fairphone, but it is as challenging as the Fairphone. Um, at the moment, more and more people need prosthesis because of uh, the, the wars that's going on, but also because of male fortition. And uh, most of these people are not capable to buy them. They're to between 1,000 or 20,000 euros, depending on what kind of material you have. You need, for children, you need every half a year a new version. Uh, it will take you half a year to get one. It's very difficult to get hold on procedures. Uh, so we work together with uh, HONF. Um, uh, it, it's a group in, in um, Indonesia. And to think about a downloadable prosthesis. So what we think about is, is making an adjustable prosthesis, which would also mean that it's a step further than the prosthesis that we use in the West. Because if we buy a prosthesis here, and we need our need, you have to go back and forth to the professional to adjust it. And so we also make a, 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 a prosthesis that is adjustable and you can sort of, um, uh, you are the, the most intelligent person in using your prosthesis. So it's also um, um, uh, leveling the, the way as, as, a, as a user that you're involved in your own um, uh, pr uh, prosthesis. Uh, the, sex, the next step, of course, is lowering the cost. Uh, make it sustainable, using local materials, exchanging knowledge, and open and downloadable. downloadable. So we, we make the project so that other people can, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, adjust it, make it better, uh, put their energy in it. It's a very interesting collaboration between the medical people that are involved in this and, and the hackers community, the movement around 3D printing and everything, because it's, it's bringing this different knowledge together. Um, and it's really sort of revolutionizing the whole idea of prosthesis. Um, and of course, the next step is to um, to to, for, to to go and make it also uh, an introduction here in the not only in, in Indonesia but also in here. So these are one of the steps that are, we have to make to make a, a removable feet and also to make the, the joints that can move. So there's a lot of stuff that you will recognize. You can make this with Fab Labs, local Fab Labs. We're also looking for other materials. So the last. Um, uh, example I want to bring to you is the do-it-yourself bio movement. Uh, we opened uh, only uh, well, two, two weeks ago. We opened the Open Wet Lab, which is a place fully equipped with all the stuff that you need to do biotechnology. And uh, before we have been in working with artists and designers and life science people over the last five years, and all the time we had to ask for permission to, to enter a lab, and they would say, "Well, nice project, maybe." or no, this project is not possible in our space, or we don't have time, or it's, we're not interested. We have a beautiful project called Artists and Designers for Genomics, where we brought people together, designers and scientists, and these have been great work. But we always had to go for this permission. And since two weeks, we have all the equipment in our own space, and we don't have to ask for permission anymore. And in a certain way, that feels so good. It feels so sovereign, something that we are looking for uh, over the years. So, um, of course, what can you do in a do-it-yourself bio lab? Uh, a lot of people are questioning that. Uh, of course, you can make GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Um, not sure if that's the way to go. But you also can make uh, open diagnostic devices, like Amplino. 
So the person who is running the, the open wet lab in the, the do-it-yourself movement in, 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 in Amsterdam, Peter, uh, is, is also working on the Amplino project. And as far as I know, Amplino makes, makes use of um, Arduino, of course. It's an open box. Uh, if you want to do malaria testing now, you have to um, uh, make a blood sample, send it to one of the labs in the West. It will take you a week, and then you will be too late to give the right uh, medicine to the person. So what this Amplino is trying to do is making a box, a small box, the whole, put the whole lab into a small box and make it mobile and put it in place where the people re are really in need for it. Um, so I think that's, that's, that those, those kind of things can be, you need not only the open design part, the, the, the hardware, uh, you, you need uh, all kind of uh, machines that are also now open hardware, like the 3D printing uh, movement, it's also moving into the biotechnology. You also need the, the science and the, 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 the wet part to make this happen. Um, so, we, so again, I think what, we, what we're facing, so both with the Fairphone and also with Amplino and the, the, the prosthetic, is that you're moving into a system, an eco economic system, that as long as you're small, they maybe think you're nice. But we definitely are facing some, can face some issues when, we, when it grows larger. I'm not saying that we will be the one that grows large, but somewhere in, in uh, what's happening now, people are challenging the powers that be, the model that Friedman imposes on us, that we don't have to know who is responsible for our products and our ideas, and, and, as, and that we can sort of stay away from the thousands of people that are involved in making our products. And, and I, we, we all know here, and this is, I think, only the beginning of that movement, is that in a lot of places in the world, people are making this kind of strategies and designing in an open way, in open fashion, models and ideas and technologies that really are from a different nature, that, that, take, that put social values first, that are open, that want to be transparent, that want to relate, and not in a, in a sense that people have to be impersonal, but they want to have personal relationships. And this is also possible now. We, we, can, we, ha we are able to have relationships, we are able to be transparent, and we, have to, and we are also able to know about our products. And at a certain moment, we are going to expect that we know about the product, that we are not wanting to have a product that we have no idea about how, what, what the consequences are and who has suffered in the production lane. So um, I think the, mo the movement where we are now is, is the, the question was only raised, like, is this just an idea or is it just a, are we sort of believing in something that's not going to happen? Um, only one and a half years ago, we were presenting the open design book, which Peter also referred to in, in Berlin, and people were really hostile, the, especially the design people were very hostile. They said, well, this is not a business model, you're taking away my IP, how am I going to make my money? So a lot of people were sort of reacting to the whole concept of open design still as something of the old model with a signature designer which makes a design and then somebody else steals it or sort of tries to... And I think open design will have its, have its implications in the way that I'm telling you now. It's, it's, it will be part of new systems. It's not about sort of make, taking away the position of the, the aesthetic design. It, it, it will sort of go into the system of production. And that will really have an enormous impact. And as with open source and open hardware, open design will in that sense be one of the sort of disruptive forces in our industry. Um, just to, to also, I, I, I can't, I have to uh, also point to PRISM, because um, as we speak, being here, just telling these stories, you have these two stories at the same time. We have this internet that is enabling us, which is distributed network, for everybody here to, to build upon on this technology, this network, their own business, their own ideas, their concepts to connect, uh, outside of the infrastructures or the bigger institutions. At the same time, this internet is under threat. And under the surface, there are things going on that we really have to be very careful about. And um, to me, th there's a very I think maybe, maybe, I hope, the, 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 re the, the stories, the talks that we have now about PRISM is that people started to understand that it's about sovereignty. It's not about the question, do you, ha do you have anything to hide? And it's, a terror, it's for terrorists um, uh, to, to, to find ways to, to, to attack the terrorists. It's really about, do we, are, is a state still sovereign? If not, if, if, if a citizen is not, why is our country not? And so I think, I hope 
the level of, of, of disturbance is starting to, to get higher. And that's maybe a percent a day. I don't know how many people have to be somewhere in, in embassies or being in, 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 in airports uh, or even in prison before we realize that really something is really at stake. And I think we, sh we can't afford to miss this point, that we have to really act on this and be very careful. Because a lot of these stories about PRISM and ACTA and PIPA and, and the, all the stuff, sometimes it's very complex. Sometimes you feel like, okay, there are certain people that are experts in it, they will do the job. But it's really about moving into this uh, story again. And I think this story about, um, this was a story today in The Guardian, about a person who writes, a, a journalist who says actually, exactly this. Before I thought, well, I have nothing to hide, don't, don't make so much, so much fuss about it. But I suddenly realized that there's really something at stake. And she describes that she wants to enter the debate, and I think that's really important. That don't leave the technology with the people that are expert, but really move into the debate and, and, and figure out what are, the, what, is the, what are the values behind the technologies. And, and, and really start to, 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 to find a way to, to uh, improve the way that we balance the, the, reciprocity, the reciprocity of our systems. And it's not about only PRISM and, and the US spying on us, it's also the systems that we apply, uh, like uh, electronic patient dossiers, all that kind of systems that our governments ask us to participate in because we are a citizen. Really be very careful and, and doubt if it's well designed. I think the design also have to move into the algorithms and designers have to move into the technology systems that surrounds us. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Miss Double K, for, just to be sure. That's well there. Well there. We have time for a couple of questions. Okay. Is there any question? Difficult to see. Thank you, Marlene. Um, Three great examples, and what I like about them most is that they're practical, doable, actionable, <coughs> and a lot of people have thought about how you actually uh, build an alternative value proposition, which is at the root of alternative economies, the creation of different kinds of value, and what we value. And it's a thought that's been going through my head all day, how does open design communicate better the new values that it supports. Not just economic values, but social values. And how does it talk about new models of enterprise or business? And how do we communicate that? So you started, I think, with three great examples, but I suspect you're a, a very uh, active organization in the Netherlands. You have a lot of funding, and those projects were supported by a lot of people and a lot of energy and money. But I think a lot of the other projects we talked about today don't have those resources. So how can we talk more about value propositions? How open design creates real new value uh, for the people involved, the co-collaborators, and new values for society? So that's really my question. Well, I think one part of the question is that uh, the, the Waag is an um, institute that is well funded. Well. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, yes, maybe, but we have built this structure over the last 20 years. And we very deliberately started to work on an incubator 10 years ago. Uh, because we wanted to have, if you look at our mission, we want to have social impact. Which means that you want to go beyond uh, a nice project uh, and having, being, having a design award of being somewhere in a gallery or in a, in a, on stage. We, we think that part, I mean, part of our mission is to, to, to of course, to generate the knowledge, to share it, and to give it away, and, and organize academies. We, we organize this open, minor, open design minor together with, with, with an, an academy. So we are there, of course, to, to, to share our knowledge. But at a certain moment, you realize that if you want to have a real impact, there has to be an alternative on the market. And a market not perceived as the market that Friedman is, 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 is telling us, but a new type of market. Um, so 10 years ago, I started to figure out if somebody could help me 
So without losing our identity, without losing our social mission, and I found these people, and they started to help out, and they started to, 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 to help and organize the, the patient money, the social money. So um, Fairphone is possible, not only we have these great people or, and, and passionate people like Boss and the other people, Miguel and the, the whole group of people that are doing it actually, and are not sleeping at night and, and, and are passionate to, to, to bring this further. It is also because we, we as a VAG structure, found a person to put some, first, some money in first. Uh, to pay, so I think if you if you say how can we, is this a, is this a model that other people could help or use? I think we have to figure out more of those kind of structures as as we found out in the last 20 years, and I hope we will together find more ways to find patient capital, social capital su to support the ideas that comes out of this crowd. Um, and I think we are moving into that area because the whole concept of social enterprise is finally sort of touching base. Uh, there, are, there are now programs that are sort of learn uh, how to set up a company and a mission. I think it was um, before that, if you would say you, would, you, you were a company, they would say, oh, you're, you're, so you're in there for the money. And when you're a foundation or a, a, a movement, they would say, oh, you're there to be subsidized. And I think we're moving into an area that you can say, no, I, my, my, we want to put social values first, but we want to go into a market, we want to have a sustainable business model for it. But it's not about shareholders' value. It is about social impact. And I think more and more people will start to believe in it. But we definitely have to share this kind of practices together. Does it answer your question? <laughs> OK. What's the part that I, that you, that I missed? I think at the more, if, if you look around and, and how people want to live, I mean, at, at the end, you come back to a very, um, very specific question: is why are we here, and what is why are we where, where do we live for? It's, it's a very philosophical question. And um, at the moment, if you look at all, if if you look at hundred percent of the people, many people couldn't care less for that question. They just have to. They just, they just, they're ignorant. They just do the stuff. It has to be efficient. It has to be cheap. They, they go for, for, the, for the easy ride. And there's also a group of people that are really depending on other people. They're, 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 they're a part of a system, and they, they don't know how to deal with the system. But they're also a group of the willing, like, like the people that, that, that think about the, the, the sovereign uh, uh, citizen that wants to have control over its life and tries to fight back the Occupy movement, the 1% movement, the 99% the, the movement, I mean. And um, I think the value there is that you, have, uh, that you live a life that makes sense. It's, it's like Peter Sloterdijk was saying, you have to, what is a decent life? And you don't want to have uh, products that, are, uh, is, is other pe that other people have to suffer for. So I think this whole notion of being a good citizen means that you want to have other products and other designs. So, so the value would be that you have, if you buy, if it, I think this is why people already have ordered the Fairphone, is that they said, I, want to, I don't want to have blood in the mobile. I, I want to have products that I believe in, and that I can really relate to. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that not all the people will be, buy a Fairphone. And I'm pretty sure that this is, this is only, as not everybody is make, uh, making their own food, not everybody is buy, buying bio uh, meat, but it's more and more people are getting there. And it's definitely a value proposition for 10% of this population, maybe 5%. It's still a very good uh, 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 model for, for having a, uh, a good business model.